festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor, we will not forget, and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. Welcome back, everybody. Um, it's so good to continue this week with JLF Colorado. We were so deeply heartened last week uh, experiencing JLF once more, even virtual. We presented some astonishing and enlightening sessions last week, and I encourage you to check out these recordings. This week, we continue to bring you intriguing sessions that we think you'll find meaningful and illuminating. And on behalf of JLF Colorado, Festival co-directors Namita Gokali and William Dalrymple, Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library, and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to this session, Atrocity and the Retrieval of Culture with Pupe Misagi and Douglas Pennock. Violent upheavals in societies often lead to the loss of cultural treasures and the repression of cultural knowledge. Douglas Pennock and Pupe Misagi write of different cultures, past and present, imagined and real, and what is lost and the efforts to retrieve culture after the violence. We'll begin with a reading from Pupe. Pupe Misaji is a writer, a translator, both into, into and out of Persian, and an educator. Her debut novel, Trans Relating House One, was published in 2020. Her nonfiction, fiction, and translations have appeared in numerous journals, and she has several books of translation published in Iran. She is currently faculty at the Department of Writing at Pratt Institute, Brooklyn. Please warmly welcome Pupin Misagi. Thank you so much, Jesse, for that introduction. Um, thanks to um, Jaipur Festival for having me, and I'm so glad to be here tonight with everyone and to be in conversation with Douglas. So I'm gonna read um, a few pages from my um, novel, um, just to give you a little bit of context. Um, it's this, the framework of the story is, um, public statues um, start disappearing from public spaces in Tehran and a woman um, goes around the city trying to find what has happened to the statues um, but she realizes that there are other bodies that also have disappeared um, meanwhile. So I'm going to read from the narrative part of the book. Um, and the main character is just she, but there's also an I that's coming. Um, that's the author um, just giving some commentary on that um, layer of the book. Outside the window, the city moves. She is on a bus in the women only section. She knows the city and she doesn't know the city. 
She sees the city outside the bus windows and she reads the city in the newspaper on her lap. The city is disappearing, dying. The city is resisting, being born. It dies every second. It comes back to life every second after. The city keeps reappearing. The city is gaining more presence. Inside her, a very loud silence. The city is disintegrating. Outside her, noises. A map creates a map before the city falls apart. She hears a ghostly voice and turns around. Nobody is saying anything. I desire for her to create a map that can reinvent itself every time the city does. A secret map, a personal map, an internal map, a map in words, a map in tongues. Today, the city is not what it was yesterday. Tomorrow, it won't be what it is today. The map needs to be continuously rebirthed. New places, new names, new roads, new lines, like cells, like veins, of her body, of my body, of the bodies of the women and men on the bus, of the bodies of the women and men outside the bus, of the bodies in the city making the text. The map of the city is to be drawn with words. The map is the text, the text is the map. The text is the city, but even that will not remain stable. Even that will be forever changing. The text breathes, the text grows, the text decomposes, the city grows and dies and dies and grows. The city decomposes, the city breathes. She turns around. Everyone is looking outside. Everyone is looking inside. Nobody is saying anything. Traffic has come to a halt. The bus is stuck, not moving, idling. Outside people have gathered, are waiting. She looks out to see. Other women too. Someone calls out to the bus driver to open the doors. He does. Some leave out the front door, out the back door. She cranes her neck. A cow is slaughtered in the middle of the square. She sees a big banner covering several store signs. We welcome a new police mission for social order, it says. We are the store owners. We are they. They welcome the new mission. They welcome the order. They have the cow killed. They have the cow sacrificed. A sacrifice for gratitude, for thankfulness. The city will be cleansed of addicts, vagrants, beggars, peddlers, of the vicious and immoral. Traffic laws will be better implemented. The new mission will improve the lives of the citizens and the city. Better days will come. The city will become pure. The cow is sacrificed in the middle of the day, in the middle of the square. The cars and human beings come to a halt to watch the cow die, to welcome a new era of social order. Bus passengers stare. People gather on the green patch in the middle of the square and stare. The cow lies in the middle of the road. The cow bleeds. The cow breathes. The cow is a corpse. The corpse is too heavy. Shopkeepers cannot move it into a van. Onlookers join to help. Shopkeepers and onlookers cannot move the cow that is now the corpse into a van. They gather. They touch each corner of the body. They try. They hold on to. They hold their breath. They push. The corpse remains on the road. In the middle of the square, a fountain continues to breathe water into the air. Water rises up and drops down. A tow truck is called. Life comes to a halt before the corpse of the cow. The sacrifice, the ritual, the cow, the people, the cars, together entangled. The narrow path around the body kept open to traffic is now a knot of cars and buses and motorbikes and people. The sound of horns, the murmurs and shouts of humans, the silence of the animal, the silence of the trees and the crows standing watch. The knot cannot be untied until the corpse is moved away. The passersby pause for a moment, then move on, or they pause for a moment and stay for another. Or they move to the center to see, to understand, and then try to find a way out or decide to stay a bit longer before moving on. The cow corpse begins to rot on the asphalt in the square. An hour later, the tow truck arrives and the driver and the shopkeepers and the men get together and with the help of a metal chain, move the corpse from the pavement up behind the truck. 
traffic officers open a path through the crowd. The truck moves slowly away. The water continues to flow from the, mount, from the fountain. The cow is gone. The blood of the cow dries on the asphalt under the sun. The crows sing and fly away. The trees continue to stand still. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. That was really powerful and in a way that I think is really meaningful to many of us in the United States who feel so distant from so many other parts of the world. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll now have Douglas Pennock read. Douglas Pennock has written texts for operas, novels, and shorter work which has appeared in Tricycle, Descant, New England Review, Parabola, Chicago Quarterly, Publishers Weekly, Agni, Kyoto Journal, Verfois, and Utne Reader. His book of essays, The Age of Waiting, which engages the atmospheres of ecological collapse, will be published in 2020. Douglas, over to you. Make sure you unmute. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here with you and with all kinds of people I can only imagine. And uh, it's a wonderful thing that we can come together across the world and that the Jaipur Literary Festival makes this possible. And that it's you and Jules over many years that have also made it happen. So that's a wonderful thing. And thank you. It's a wonderful thing to be part of. Um, I'm going to, The Age of Waiting, the book from which this is, this is towards the beginning, uh, is basically an assemblage of uh, fragmentary uh, memoir essays. And it'll be uh, Aerosmith Press, which has been very patient and uh, uh, wonderful, uh, is going to bring it out in about six weeks. So I'll just start. Stories from innumerable human cultures tell of a moment when the presiding deity wearied of the greedy, self-centered dealings of men and women, of the corruption they have inflicted on society and the world. The, de the deity, whoever she or he might be, then sent a great flood to purify the earth, Rains descended, rivers and lakes overflowed, oceans and seas covered the land. Humanity with all its spoiled and ungrateful megalomania was washed away. And though humanity has re repeatedly returned, whether from flood or drought, from fire or war or plague, it has always again fallen. Now the landscapes of our passage on the earth is a di diorama of ruins, of great cities, of strange funerary monuments, half-forgotten philosophies, outlines of gardens, broken amphitheaters, nameless corpses, ruined palaces, fragmentary poetry, lyrics without music, spiritual paths without practitioners, libraries without books. Our time on earth is recorded in what remains of histories and innumerable epics where kings, heroes, and warrior queens lead their people into battle, fight to conquer or resist conquest, enslave or become enslaved, destroy worlds, and see worlds destroyed. And now we feel again the end approaching. The tempo of mass destruction has increased. The last century saw unparalleled slaughter, destruction, and dislocation. It saw two world wars, internal slaughters in China, Russia, Cambodia, Uganda, the atom bomb, the Holocaust, and innumerable other episodes of mass violence. Dread and unreality now pervade the mindstream of the age. Jorge Semprun, a Spanish resistance, a resistance agent in Paris, was arrested by the Gestapo in 1943. He was 18 years old. He spent the remainder of the war in the kingdom of the dead known as Buchenwald. 
Upon his release, he found the world of normal living a painful and alien terrain. He said, death loomed up once again in my future, cunning and inevitable. I would then have the precise and crushing impression of living only in a dream, of being a dream myself, before dying in Buchenwald, before drifting away in smoke across the Etherberg, I dream of this future, this deceptive incarnation. There never was a golden age. There never has been a life of enduring attainments and lasting peace. Our time, our sense of time is, de is defined by a struggle to exist by impermanence, repeated loss, by constant termination. From the beginning, our world has been ending, end over end. Individuals and populations have always experienced the destruction of the world. Hélène Sixus does not hold back when she says, death gives us the essential primitive experience access to the other world, which is not without warning or noise. It gives us everything. It gives us the end of the world. To be human, we need to experience the end of the world. Now, indeed, we may be in the, in the most global and final version of our repeated extinctions. The earth may no longer endure the burden of overpopulation the industrial production that provides an everlasting, an ever larger population with ever higher standards of material life. Now, perhaps more clearly than ever before, we are looking at the end of time as measured in terms of a human generation or lifespan of human memory altogether. But, Madame Sixus continues, we need to lose the world, to lose a world, and to discover there is more than one world, and that the world isn't what we think it is. The great Zen teacher Shunryu Suzuki endured the destruction and rebirth of his homeland. He once instructed his students in this way, don't move, just die over and over. Don't anticipate. Nothing can save you now because you have only this moment. Not even enlightenment will help you now because there are no other moments. With no future, be true to yourself and express yourself fully. Just die over and over. In the paralyzing New York August heat, the whole city is sweating. Pedestrians avoid the sides of the street with di direct sunlight. I'm in the shadow of an awning drinking iced tea. Across the street in the glaring heat, an old white man in rags, drunk, rummages in a trash bin, looks up, and stares at me, furious, insane. Hey, man, even from the other side of the street, it's as if he's seeing something in me I don't want to know about. Yes, you fucker. What are you going to do? It's over, finished. What are you going to do? I want to look at something else, but can't. The old man gives me a demented, toothless leer. He reaches down into the trash, and his hand comes out filled with some lumpy, white, semi-liquid that might be yogurt. It drips between his blackened fingers as he stuffs it in his mouth, watching me all the while. The white goo runs out of the corners of his mouth. His grin turns again to fury. Don't look away. Thank you. Wow, that was really beautiful and really moving both readings and what a message for us. And uh, Pupit and Douglas, um, 
I think at this time, we're most interested to bring you into conversation with one another <clears throat> about your work. And I'm interested in the questions and thoughts you have to share with each other and with the audience. So I hand it over to the two of you. And Pupe, you need to uh, unmute. Thank you. Can, can I ask you a question, Pupe? Sure, yes. This, it was very moving, the whole sense of a ritual that uh, with the cow, that when you start describing it, you know, at first it's not particularly clear that it's a ritual or that it's a sort of a commercial butchering activity, you know, and, and throughout how we should relate to something that echoes something, something deep from the past. Mm -hmm but isn't presented in a context that tells you exactly what it is. I thought that was really wonderful. And, um, I wondered about how you go about thinking how we can recover the past in that way, or mm -hmm. it's a by our presence with it, you know? Right. So, um, I really like your observation, like noting, like, if we, like how the killing could also be a commercial killing, right? And even though that particular scene is um, a ritual, it's a ritual that is used not for the enhancement of our humanity, but it's used in the hands of those in power, right? Um, so in a way, like the store owners are slaughtering this cow as a ritual, but in a sense, they are um, kind of like lip serving the um, authorities who are introducing this new mission, right? Mm. Um, so to respond to your question, I feel like in a way, like both sides or all different parties use what we have from the past for their own intentions, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very important that we also continue to hold on to the past in the sense of like what it was originally intended for, right? To help us be connected with the world around us, to create meanings that make us part of the larger world rather than make it part of the corrupt human society that only is feeding its own greed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if... Like we can't really lose that because even the negative forces are not losing that. They're still holding on to what we have from the past and feeding us the same yeah. um, discourse. Um, but I guess, yes, like holding on to it in a sense of not losing sight of the fact that it needs to bring us back to a connection with the world, not to separate us from the world, if that makes sense. Sure. And that's a felt connection. Mm hmm Yeah. You know, you may not know actually why you're feeling it. Mm hmm It's like an echo from something far away. Right. And in a sense, like how it doesn't necessarily produce something tangible or produce something concrete, right? But as you said, like it's a felt connection. Oh, the storm here is crazy. I hope you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. We can. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Go ahead. So is, is there a lot of that. I mean, is, is that sort of what's in your book? The larger. In the book. So there are, it's interesting that you quoted actually Siksu in your reading because I also bring a lot of quotes from Siksu in this work. Um, but there is like, as a multi-layered book, there is like this constant um, push and pull between different parts of our humanity. There is um, the documentation of um, the people who, had, who were killed in 2009 and afterwards by the Iranian government. But there's also the life that keeps continuing in the city, pushing against that. And also this desire to continue to be a witness, to continue to hold on to this hope for justice. 
Um, so in that sense, um, how our everyday rituals continue to keep us grounded to life while death is always present. That's beautiful. Well, and I think also essential. Mm -hmm. Because we live in actually also commercial culture all the time. All the mm -hmm. time. And that has none of that. Right. Right. You, know, you meet people who have tremendous nostalgic feeling for the Brady Bunch. You know, in TV shows. And mm -hmm. not their mom, not their grandma, no. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Or the past is represented as something that we want to move away from toward this future that is supposed to be more bright, right? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. What I really, it was interesting, like you and I shared work that was not what we read tonight, but interestingly, I think our reading actually went, came even closer than the text that we had shared, which was amazing. Um, like it was as if like through some force, we just like found our ways back to each other. Um, I was really amazed by like how um, your piece discusses so much death and acknowledges its, its presence, but it's also like so much filled with life and like construction and hope, right? So I wonder if like you would speak more about that. Well, yeah, um, something new is always happening, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like you go to a funeral of someone you love and something unbelievably ridiculous happens and you first start laughing. I mean, so we can't, it's, it's that quality of life that I find extremely um, hopeful in a way. Uh, we were at a friend's house in Germany and on the wall, was an incredibly boring picture. It was sort of like a really boring uh, Cezanne kind of thing, of a, of a completely stupid little piece of landscape. And he said that that painting, so you look at it, he said, this painting was painted by my father in Paris when he was, had been forced to become part of the army of occupation for the Germans, on the day he met my mother. Wow. You know, so you look at this, the world is full of these nondescript things that have in them, either echoes of rituals or personal pasts and and so much life. I mean, it makes you cry and it's, it's great. And I think as we try and struggle to figure out how we should deal with ecological disasters and, and political disasters. We have to go to that that part. Because mm -hmm. it's full of surprises. Right. And I guess that's like the hardest, the harder thing to do, right? Like yeah. we keep being overwhelmed with in the different types of turmoil that just surround us right just like this constant sense of we are losing every battle that we are entering yes. um but also like yeah but what other choice do we have to keep holding on to the life that exists right yeah yeah and if we're losing every battle uh we still battle on you know and that's what it is you know yeah yes yeah. that's true uh, so what are you going to do next? Good question. <laughs> um, I'm working on um, two different projects. Um, one is a novella. Um, it's in its early straight stages, but um, looking even more closely into um, machinery of death in the hands of politicians. Um, yes. And the other one, the other work is looking at meanings of home. So I think like I feel to, I have to do like both at the same time 
and see how it goes. How about you? Your book is coming out just in six weeks, right? I think so, yeah. And yeah. you're already at work on something else. I am. I sort of don't, it's, it's a little embarrassing. It's sort of about storytelling. It's about the endless. What? Embarrassing, that's amazing. It's endless storytelling, endless, endless world of stories. So I want to do something with that. Yeah. That sounds great. If you have something you would like to do that it's, it's, it's impossible, you know, you would have to have somebody ask you that you don't even know who it is. What, do you have anything like that? Um, impossible. I guess traveling now feels like the impossible thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the desire for that. So I guess like I've been reading more in the sense of like that's like my way of like making the impossible happen. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I you? I was thinking of I would love to do a puppet show. Oh. <laughs> I would love it. But I don't have I don't have any of those skills, and I don't wouldn't know even how to begin. So I would have to meet somebody who knew how to do those things. Maybe but, that's like the new the new project. Maybe it could happen. But <laughs> we have friends who have spent their lives as puppeteers, and um, when I first met him, which was on, maybe eight years ago, it was one of those things. I sat down and I said. If you took apprentices, I would be your apprentice. He just had that kind of, there's nothing commanding about him, just that authenticity yeah. of someone who has worked very hard at a craft that's very traditional in one way and mm -hmm. can always be you know. So I, I think that's also, I think it became a somewhat model for me in thinking about what we are trying to do. Something that's traditional, mm -hmm. but, isn't it? but also to the present, yeah. yeah. Jesse, we see your back. <laughs> um, yeah, if um, this would be a good time. If you have any last uh, comments or thoughts for each other, that would be great. No, it was a pleasure to meet you in person, Douglas, mm -hmm. and to continue this conversation. Well, let's continue this. Out of all of this... Um, uh, you know, sickness thing and, and the fact that we can't meet in person, actually we would never have met otherwise. So I'm That's finding good. there are a lot of things happening in this and, and um, the Jaipur Festival and bringing people together from all over the world and who would never meet, never, never, never. I mean, we went and heard a lecture from a Russian professor in Moscow and you can see he's in his dining room and he's sitting there talking to you like this and it was more intimate than, you know, Actually, if he was on a stand, and there were people mm -hmm. all over the world listening, so we're part of it. Thank you, thank you, Jesse, for bringing us together, and also for making it possible for this kind of thing to continue and be so fruitful. Yeah, thank you, Jesse, and for the whole crew in India who are doing this so early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I, I. So I'm so moved by this uh, conversation and how deep you've gone into the, the fabric of life and death and who we are as human beings. Um, thank you so much. That continual thread of light that is persistent in all of us from time immemorial. Um, and Douglas, when you talk about uh, you know, writing about storytelling, I mean, there's no, nothing more than storytelling. That's all we have. So. I would think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you, got, you reached your conclusion before I wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my specialty. Right? So, <laughs> thank you both so very, very, very much. Thank, thank you. you all for watching and for being a, a really great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available through Boulder Bookstore within the USA and Full Circle within India. Um, please do support your local bookstore. Please follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and stay apprised of our upcoming sessions. Also, stay tuned to jlflitfest.org forward slash Colorado for the full schedule and information about our speakers. 
In these unusually difficult times, we have struggled to bring you JLF Colorado without charging a registration fee. If you're able, we appreciate you donating as generously as you can to JLF Colorado to ensure a free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge. Once again, we would like to thank all of our official partners. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session, Find Me, Andre Asaman, in conversation with Anandita Ghosh at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7.30 a.m. India Standard Time. And don't forget, these will all be available um, on YouTube and Facebook uh, as recordings. Thank you once again, everybody. And now we present a reading by Anna Heyman Arif from the Jaipur Writers Shorts series. Thank you. Lee. Ad nauseum by Anna Heyman Arif. The smell of the day wafts through the house, settling on chairs, curling up in corners. A miasma of perpetual waiting pervades through, above, below, weaving through the wattles, potosterum blossoms, washing. Flapping sheets hold it off, corners dripping, flicking drops on bare legs. Lately, the name of the day seems to slip between weeks, months, fading away. Lately, earlier, before, temporality holds little meaning, yet all the meaning in the world. Dates loiter by, flipping the finger. Of what use are we? They say sulkily. Before, dates were held close and dear. Before, after, redundant binaries persist. A mote of dust is suspended in a slice of afternoon sun. Lazily, it floats downwards taking all the time in the world. library or perhaps even a library of life do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science of the joys of poetry and music the consolations of philosophy the sense of literature and of life about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF co coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I 
I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. Work Arts, bringing India to the world, the world to India, through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Teamwork Arts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars. Be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalaotsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, Festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Art so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. 
while the multi-city Kahani festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination. Bollywood Love Story, a musical. Our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information visit www.teamworkarts.com I think everywhere I've ever